this morning we come to the part of the service that we have exhortation. And we've led up to this part of the service by already remembering the precious blood of Christ upon the cruel cross of Calvary. So we're going to be studying regarding that this morning. But I'm going to be putting my emphasis on what is in the blood that makes it so precious for us today. We're going to be looking at blood as how God rendered it to us today throughout the different times uh, throughout the history of mankind. He demanded certain respect for that blood. So we're going to learn uh, regarding that this morning. Well, when you look at the scripture we're using this morning, it's going to be found in First Peter, the first chapter, starting with the 17th through the 19th verse. And at this time, I would like to read that particular scripture and then lead into the other parts of our service this morning. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear knowing, and it is a reason here, that we need to look forward to the time that we're going to be departing this uh, earth and facing the judge of all time. It says, knowing you have not rendered, not redeemed, with corruptible things like what? Silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers. What? But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, when he gives this particular scripture and talks about it, he talks about things that we know and can relate to here upon this earth that are very precious to us, and that is silver and gold. That's the most precious thing that he could relate to that we can understand we can't understand anything that's as precious as the blood of Christ, but he relates it to a human thing, and then it's more precious than gold and silver, Christ's blood. And he indicates that it is lamb about blemish, and as Brother Ken pointed out this morning, you know, they took the best of the flock, and that's what they gave. So when Christ came to this earth, he was given the best he had to us. That was his precious blood. So what is it about the blood that makes it so precious to us today? So we're going to go back to Noah when he was left the ark, and God gave him some special instructions. He renewed his covenant with mankind because he destroyed all mankind. There was Noah and his family that was to repopulate the earth. So he lays out different instructions. If you go back to Numbers, the uh, rather Genesis, the ninth chapter, there it, he lays out that he's given everything to man at his disposal as far as his creation. But he gives some restrictions there, and he says, But you shall not eat of the flesh with its life, that is the blood. Surely for your blood, the lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning. So what is it that's in the blood? You know, we just mentioned blood, but we don't stop and think, you know, what's in the blood? He tells us there what's in the blood, and why there's such a respect for the blood. The life is in the blood. And he's talking about animals here at this particular point in time. He's saying, you don't, you respect the, the blood that's in that animal because the life is in that blood. And it's, as we'll get into it a little later, he's going to show that that blood is used as an atoning factor. And that's what Christ is going to be giving to us. He's going to be giving his life blood for us, for remission of our sins. And when you look at the instructions, even was given under the law of Moses, 
it talked about that in Leviticus, the 17th chapter. They're picking up in the 10th verse. And he said, And whatever man of the house of Israel or the stranger who dwells among you who eats any blood, that is taking the blood that hadn't been drained out of an animal and eats it or drinks blood itself, I will set my face against that person who eats blood. And I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar. What? To make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. So the life is in the blood. And the blood is what is used as an atonement for our soul. And when he talks about animals here, we're going to find that under the old law, that was what was used to make atonement for the souls of men. So that blood was to be drained out and put on the ground and not consumed as part of their daily eatings. And even today, you stop and think about it. When they prepare an animal for human consumption in our time, they drain the blood out of that animal, and then they'll package it for human consumption. Well, we're even doing that today. The life is in the blood, as he points out, and he commands them to drain it out. As you can read in Deuteronomy to the 12th chapter, the 16th verse, as well as the 12th chapter, the 23rd verse, as well as in the 15th chapter, the 23rd verse, and you can go over to Samuel, the first chapter, the 14th, chapter the 34th verse where they were commanded that that blood of that animal was to be drained out and not eaten as part of the place the life is in the is in the blood and that blood is what is used for atonement uh, for the sins and uh, for the sins of the people and we find even in the new testament times as was referred to last Wednesday night, there in Acts, the 15th chapter, about how the Paul and Barnabas went down to Jerusalem to settle the matter of circumcision. Well, they settled the matter of circumcision according to what God wanted for his people, Christians' uh, dispensation. But they did send some encouragement back to those Christians in Antioch and throughout the different parts of the world. And in that he said, they encouraged him not to what? Eat anything that was strangled, something that is strangled. It's strangled with the blood in it. You don't eat that animal. It's got the blood in it, it had the life in it. That blood was to be drained out. It was to be restricted. And, uh, and, and he indicates it as in Genesis there, as well as blood itself. It was to be respected. And the thing about blood, that again, is the, the life of that animal. And that blood was to be drained out and not used. And of course, when it was used in blood there in Acts, the 15th chapter, regarding the instruction, there was also encouragement given to those uh, early Christians, was the fact that the Gentiles, for the most part, were idolatrous worshipers. And they were using blood in a certain way as part of their consumption of their sacrifice uh, to that idol. He said, you just stay away from those kind of things. That is not uh, things that the Lord respects. And he will turn, uh, turn, he will turn you away from those things or, or you will be uh, facing destruction for, for using those things in a way it's not pleasing in his sight. But what I'd like to do is just sort of go back to the Garden of Eden and go forward a little bit to show how blood was used throughout uh, those particular dispensations to lead up to the blood of Christ that was given uh, for us. Well, in the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, when they sinned, it showed that there has always, blood has always been important element in man's relationship to God. Well, when Adam and Eve sinned, they realized they were naked for the first time. And when God 
appeared unto Adam and Eve in the garden, they hid themselves. And they hid themselves because they were naked. And God said, how did you know you were naked? He said, have you eaten of the tree of life? And of course they had. So, uh, so God took animal skins and clothed them. Well, to take an animal skin and clothe them, that animal had to give up its blood in order to be able to clothe Adam and Eve upon that particular occasion. Well, we'll find out that blood has always had an important relationship between man and God throughout both the Old and the New uh, Testaments. Well, when you go a little further, when God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, they began to bear children. The first child was Cain. The second child was Abel. Cain was a tiller of the soul, uh, and he raised vegetables and things of this nature. Well, uh, Abel was a keeper of the flocks. He raised animals and he kept flocks. Well, God demanded sacrifices from them. Well, Cain brought his sacrifice from the land itself, uh, this uh, vegetable sacrifice. That wasn't pleasing to God. That wasn't what God expected. Well, Abel bought a sacrifice from the flock, and he bought that to God, and that was pleasing in the sight of God. But how do we know that God instructed them as to what he expected? Well, when you go over to Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 11th chapter, the fourth verse, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Well, where does faith come from? Well, when we go over to Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, they were instructed as to what God demanded of them, both Cain and Abel. But Cain did not follow what God uh, wanted to, to him to do upon that occasion. But worship of service has to be, has a touch of blood in it. We had a memorial service today for we remember the blood of Christ. And each of us has to participate in a way that's pleasing to God. Our actions are our own individual responsibilities. It was Cain's responsibility to God to do what God instructed him to do. Of course, he brought the first fruits, uh, which was vegetable sacrifice to God. God, he, he ignored what God expected of him and offered uh, what he wanted to offer on his own. And so doing, it was not pleasing to God. Even though Cain did what was not acceptable in the beginning in the sight of God, God gave him a second chance. He told him, he said, you know, if you do what, what's right, then those things which are just and right in your sight, uh, you'll benefit from it. But of course, he, he uh, rejected God's instructions, and he tried to carry out things according to what he wanted to do and know what, what God wanted him to do. As is set forth in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, the 12th verse, there's a way that seemeth right to man, but the, but the end, uh, but, but its end is the way of death. So anytime we try to do things that's different from what God instructs us, then it's not what's pleasing to God, just as what Cain was trying to offer was not pleasing to God. When you look out in the world today and people uh, don't follow the instructions we would find in the scriptures, well, that's man's thing and doing it the way they want to do it, just as way, same thing as Cain was following his own thoughts and what he wanted to offer rather than what he wanted uh, wanted from God or what God commanded him to offer. But God did make what he expected very clear to both Adam, both to Cain and Abel. Well, we find uh, today that those things that we do today has to be things that's going to be pleasing in the sight of God. And we realize that when Abel obeyed by faith, he had no idea that 
by obeying by faith, it was symbolic of something that was going to be taken way down the line. That was leading up to the Lamb of God that was to give his own life. And what what is give his own blood, which the blood has the life in it, as we are talking about here this morning. But he acted by faith. He didn't know what God was expecting of him by offering the sacrifice that had blood in it was symbolic of Christ giving his precious blood further down the line many generations later, but he acted by faith. And when we act by faith, many times we don't know what the end result may be, but we know that if we act by faith, that the promises that are set forth will be given to us. Well, what I'd like to do is just study uh, for a while regarding the Passover. As mankind grew and God told Abraham, and he set him out as the one that the promises were made to that Christ was to come from, and that led up to the children of Israel generations later after that promise. But we find that the children of Israel were in the land of Canaan, and they were in bondage in the land of Canaan. But God had promised Abraham that some time his people would be receiving the Canaan land, which is the land of milk and honey. So they went bondage, and that wasn't what God wanted for his people. And those children of Israel knew the promise that God had given to them, and they cried out to God that they were wanted to be relieved of that uh, promise, and God heard their cry. And he remembered his promise to Abraham, and he sent Moses to free them uh, from that bondage of Pharaoh. Well, as you know, there were several plagues that was brought upon Pharaoh, to trying to get him to release the children of Israel. Well, he would say, I'll release them, and then later he changed his mind and wouldn't release them. But the last one was the one that we're talking about here, is the Passover. God was going to send a death angel that was going to take the life of the firstborn throughout the land, and that was going to be of the Egyptians. But what, what about the God's people? How were they going to escape that death angel that was going to pass through? And that's where the Passover uh, came into play. And that Passover is symbolic of the lamb that they were using that it would, it would be one that would be uh, symbolic of Christ and the fact that through Christ, Christ is the way that we pass, our sins are passed over as well. Well, in Exodus 11, chapter the fifth verse, says, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh he sat on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant, who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the animals. So there's going to be a devastation that was going to hit the land. That would be the loss of the firstborn. All of those animals that had blood within them, they were, their firstborn also was going to die. And also uh, the people that were in, in the land their firstborn was going to die as well. This was the last plague that was brought on Pharaoh that, that made him release the children. Well, that Passover, as far as the children of uh, God were concerned and the instruction that was given to them, was a sin offering. It's a way of God's people to escape that devastation that, was, that would come uh, through the plague. And we find the instructions was, we're in Exodus, the 12th chapter, of the 3rd through the 13th verse. We'll not read all those verses, but paraphrase it. But it said, Each household was to kill a lamb without spot or blemish, prepared for a sin offering, and they were to place that blood on the two doorposts on the level above the door. And that was the, uh, the level, which is the support above the door. And they was to place that on there, on there. And notice that lamb was to represent Christ some years later. 
And we find that even when you go to, over to Numbers, the ninth chapter, the 12th verse, to show this all tied back to Christ, it said that the, a bone of that lamb was to be broken. And when you go over to the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, the 36th verse, we find there when Jesus was hanging on the cross, they were to take the bodies down from the cross. And what happens in those situations when they normally the, uh, the person is still alive, they're hanging on the cross, so they'll break their leg so that they can't raise themselves up to breathe any longer. That's the way uh, they breathe. When they're hanging on the cross, they push themselves up and they allow them to breathe. But with their legs broken, they can't push themselves up any longer and then they die. Well, when they came to Jesus, they didn't break his legs because he was already dead. But they said that a, that a soldier took a spear and thrust it into Jesus' side. What came out? Water and blood. What's in the blood? It's the life that was given for us and it was being shed for us. But when you read John the ninth, in the 19th chapter, the 36th verse, it said, a, not, a bone of him was broken. What does it say? To fulfill the scriptures that were spoken regarding Christ, indicating that lamb that they were offering as part of the Passover was representing Jesus. Just as we commune this morning, looking at Christ's body and the blood that he was given uh, to us, to him. It was one whole body, and it was not broken. And even when you look over to uh, 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the seventh verse, they said, Christ is our Passover. So the Passover that they were remembering throughout the years, that was symbolic leading up to Christ, that lamb that was on it, that was going to be Christ uh, given uh, for, for them. So that lamb that they took, that was without spot and blemish, that they offered his blood, uh, and, and on that occasion, it was put on the doorpost, so when the death angel came through, that they would uh, see that blood and pass over it. Well, let us notice a, a few parallels that we find between the Passover and Christ, who is our Passover. When you look at that home, what they were instructed to do there in Exodus, the 12th chapter, the fourth verse, if that lamb w would serve that household and would serve another household, they could bring in another household as long as that lamb would serve that household. Well, that is similar to what we do today when we commune. If our communion is not large enough, or if our congregation is not is too large for our communion to serve, then it's time that we look at starting another congregation. Well, here at 21st Street, years ago, as our congregation grew, we started another congregation. They started out at West Spring Pines. You take that congregation and try to put it in this one today, you know, it'd be very difficult for us to be able to commune uh, scripturally with that large of a crowd. So you have another congregation. Well, to me, that would be comparable to that home where they were commanded that one lamb was to serve that particular household. And then those that were inside of the house, they were passed over by the death angel because the blood that had the life in it was on the doorpost and that angel would pass over that house. Well, how do you get into the church? It's through baptism. That's how we're added to the church. And we even find that in Acts the 20, chapter of the 28th verse was, as uh, Paul was instructing the Ephesian elders, he said, he told them and said, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So that blood 
is what he purchased the church for, and that's uh, what is the saving element for us. But, again, those that are in the house, by death they have angel passed over. So how is our sins passed over? It's passed over through baptism. That puts us into the house, puts us into the church. And we find there in Romans 6 chapter, the third through the fifth verses, once that we've studied here recently, in a Wednesday night study. It says, do ye know, not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? And it says, wherefore we were buried with him through baptism into the death? That is just as Christ, who was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the new Nazareth life. For if we have been united in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's what puts us into Christ. And when you go to Acts, the uh, second chapter there, what does it say when they were baptized? The Lord added to the church such as should be saved. So we're added to the church when we're baptized. But baptism represents the burial, death and burial, uh, the burial of Jesus Christ. When Christ died, because he gave up his life blood, when we're baptized and we go into that water as though we died to sin and we're raised back up out of that out of that watery grave through the blood of Christ to walk a new life which is in Christ Jesus and we've been cleansed from our sins uh, through the blood of Christ. So we can see the symbolic of the relationship between the Passover and the relationship between uh, the Lamb and Christ. Well in John the 14th chapter of the 16th verse Jesus said unto them, I'm out of the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, Jesus, through his death and burial and resurrection, he made that way that we can get in uh, to the church. Well, when we look at Moses, when he was given the law of Moses and the instructions that he was given to God, how, how was that accomplished? And how was that covenant brought into play? Well, we find that it involved blood. Blood was used in the dedication of the tabernacle. It was used to ratify the covenant, and it was also uh, used to atone the people as well. And we find there in Exodus, the 24th chapter, when God was giving him these instructions, he gave him the words that he was to write down, put in the book, and he wrote them down. And we find that he was to offer a sacrifice there in Exodus 24 chapter, the fifth verse, and he was to take that blood and he was to sprinkle it on the altar and on the blood of the covenant and on the people, according to Exodus the 24 chapter, the sixth through the eighth verses, showing the importance of blood. Blood has the life in it. It was used to ratify those commandments that God had given. And we'll find, even as you read in the scriptures, that all things that God required of man when he instituted them was ratified through blood. So, as we continue here, and we find, uh, first of all, that the, in Exodus 7 chapter, there, the people uh, told Moses, he said, all that he said, and the Lord said, we will do and be obedient. Well, they knew what was commanded to them. And of course, if you look at the children of Israel, they strayed from the things that God had commanded them to do throughout the different, different uh, dispensations that they were involved in. But we realize that God turned on those people and they were punished for their uh, sins that they were committing against them. They went back into idolatry, for instance, so they rebelled against God. As you can read, as they went through the, uh, the wilderness there. But the same is true of us today. The blood wasn't doing the children of Israel any good when they disobeyed God. Today, the blood will not do us any good if we disobey God as well. We need to be obedient to the laws in order to receive the benefits of the blood. Well, 
you can see there's a, pad, a pattern here that holds true today. Under the Old Testament, they relied on the shed blood of animals. Under the New Testament, we rely on the shed blood of Christ. According to Hebrews, this, the ninth chapter, picking up in the 16th through the 28th verses. So what I'd like to do is just read these verses, and it will point out a lot of the things that we've already discussed with you here this morning. It says, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For the testament is in force after, for it says, for a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no, longer, has no longer power at all while the testator lives. So he's saying that in order for a will to go into effect, even today, the will has no effect until the person dies. And then that will that set forth what that person desired goes into force and would be carried out. The same is true of what he's saying here. He said there has to be a death of the testator and for it to go into effect. And he says, therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. So he's saying even under the Old Testament, it was dedicated with blood. What's in the blood? It's the life that's in the blood. For even Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law. He took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, hyssop, sprinkling blood, both on the book, himself and all the people, as we related earlier, the incident, as Moses was doing that, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. What's in the blood? The life is in the blood. The life was used to show that that covenant came from God. It had life in it, which I commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood, blood with the life in it, both the tabernacle and the vessels and the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And he continues on. Therefore, it was necessary that copies of these things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrificed than these. So here he's talking about under the old law, as they made these offerings and observed the Passover, these were copies of what was to take place through Christ. For copy for Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands. In other words, he's saying Christ did not enter into an ugly tabernacle to offer sins for the people like those priests did under the old law. They entered once a year into that holy place which represented heaven, a copy of heaven while they were here upon this earth, but they did it on a yearly basis. But he said, this is only cop copies. He said, copies of the true but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. In other words, he's saying, God, Christ didn't enter into that earthly tabernacle, but when he died, he took his blood, laid it at the feet of God for us, to, for our sins, that our sins might be removed, that we can have the forgiveness of God, uh, uh, from God that we have today. It says, not that he should offer himself all, as the high priest entered the holy place every year with the blood of another. Then he would have to offer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of age, he has appeared to put away sins by a sacrifice of himself. It is appointed to man to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to who, to who, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin for salvation. 
So what a great sacrifice that Christ has given to us. How this all led of blood from the very beginning, how it was utilized throughout the various dispensations, which led up to that precious blood of Christ that is given for our sins. And he, he, and he says that we eagerly wait for the time that we can be redeemed uh, uh, be in the sight of Christ that have been redeemed from our sins through that precious blood. Well, as you can see here in conclusion, that Christ's blood is a saving thing for all mankind. That's the Lamb of God that was to take away the sins of the world, just as the uh, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming for the first time, and he knew who he was. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Yes, he was a perfect it was a sinless sacrifice, and when you go through and look at all the suffering that he went through to give that to, uh, to us today, it's a great a benefit to us. Well, in the Old Testament, we studied regarding how the blood was used under the uh, old law, and then also it was a contingent plan uh, that was put in Force or, or was uh, there the contingent uh, when it was necessary to be utilized. Well, going back to our text reading, again, we're not redeemed by material things such as silver and gold, but we're redeemed by the blood of Christ. And again, this morning we had a communion service in which we remembered by Christ Jesus. I wonder how Jesus felt upon the uh, when he was instituting the Lord's Supper as we partook of it this morning, when he could look at that lamb that they offered there uh, at that Passover and think, you know, I am that lamb. I represent that lamb, the emotions that he had. And also the apostles and the disciples that were sitting there as he instituted the Lord's Supper and then they looked back after he gave his life, what kind of emotion they had realizing that was representing the land that was to take away the sins of the world. The lesson's yours this morning. You know, as we pointed out earlier, to get into the house, to get into the church, to get into the kingdom, to receive this precious blood of, of Christ, you need to be obedient to the gospel. And we pointed that out in our lesson here this morning. That'll put you into the church. That'll put you into a safe condition. So when the end of time, the death angel will pass over you, your sins will be forgiven and you'll be holy in the sight of, of uh, God. So if there be one that's never obeyed the gospel, we invite you to come. If you've obeyed the gospel and you slid back into the world and doing things that was contrary to what God instructed us to do. Uh, you know, God always gave, as he did Cain, a second opportunity to make those things right. So you can make those things right as well and receive the blood of Christ again on your behalf. So we invite you to come while we stand and sing the song selected.